Hi, everybody. Welcome to Tapping the Wine Cellar, our In Water and in Blood special um, discussion. And Father Keith, Newton, Vicki, and I are back, and we are discussing Chapter 2 of Father Schreider's book. So, Father Keith, I'm going to let you take over. Okay. Chapter two is, is a very interesting chapter because we're at the great covenant ceremony in the desert. The, uh, the setup is we have the people who've been delivered from Egypt and they pass through the sea and they are encamped and Moses reads the whole Torah to them and they said, yes, we will accept this and we will live it. They do a great sacrifice splashing the blood of bulls on 12 altars set up to the 12 tribes and then on the people which i always find interesting because when i do the rite of sprinkling i see people try to duck and it's like gosh somebody walking around and splashing blood has got to be something to see but it's really a key part to the history of israel and there's some things we need to catch up on probably because uh, the word sacrifice does not mean what we think it means now. Normally, when we say we make a sacrifice, we give something up. But giving something up isn't what sacrifice is about in this context. Sacrifice isn't just about killing something. First, there is an offering of something essential. The first fruits not rejects, which is what happened a lot in sacrifices in antiquity. The second stage is the transformation of the offering, where the offering is offered to God. And that's where the boundary between life and death is crossed, where you go between two worlds, our world and the world of God. And then the third part, the communion, where the offering returns to us. And it's a very important act because this is a passage from slavery to freedom. This is a moment of liberation. And it's a moment that brings the people together as a nation. Before they were a bunch of slaves and they were in a strange place in the desert, a place they weren't used to. And yet in the desert is a place where people commonly encounter God. So in, in Precious Blood's uh, spirituality, this is the Sinai Covenant in blood. This is people bound together by blood. And with that, I will turn it over to Vicki. Thanks, Keith. Um, as I reflected on chapter two this week, I again was um, in awe of Bob's brilliance in his book. Um, Keith stole my thunder because I too was um, intrigued again. You know, when we think of sacrifice, we go back to Ash Wednesday and Lent, and I have to give something up as a sacrifice to get ready for Easter. And so it was nice to hear again that it is to make something sacred, to make something holy. I also like the whole idea of the ritual of sacrifice that Bob talked about because we forget in the action, it's actually a communication with God. It's a two-way street in that the world of humanity and the world of God are united in that moment of sacrifice. So I thought that was a really intriguing point. As somebody who grew up in the desert, I liked Bob's discussion about the desert um, because I'm always surprised when people say the desert is a place of survival. Um, granted, the desert I grew up in was a very much a man-made desert. But he brought up an interesting point that really struck me. He said that for Precious Blood Spirituality, in the desert, in that moment where we're concentrating on survival all the time, we live in a world where death seems to have an upper hand. And we have to remember to look to survival, look to being together. But he made a point of saying it is a, always a proclamation with rather than for the marginalized. I think sometimes we think of um, 
I'm going to stand with the poor. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to do something for them. So I really, the whole message of with the marginalized, not for the marginalized, that really jumped out and resonated for me. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Newton. Thank you, Vicki, and thank you, Father Keith. As I was reading this sacrifice, and especially this idea that the people are sprayed with the blood, I was also thinking about whether or not the blood, you know, in the Mosaic law, being in contact with dead or dying things is a way of being unclean. And in this case, it's the contact with the blood, and of course, you will appreciate this even greater with Jesus, is a way of cleansing. And so it's interesting to see the way that the this sort of metaphor is both inverted and then prefigured and fulfilled later, uh, which I think is a really powerful thing. And I also just think about what, again, I think Bob Schreider talks about how through the law, the tribes of slaves become a group of people and how the blood holds the world together. And just thinking about what does it really take, you know, today when we think of the church, when we think about our communities, um, which can feel very divided, even in just the United States, how do we understand the, the global community, the togetherness that Jesus invites us into out of our own covenantal bond with each other. And that sort of brings up uh, this past weekend, I happened to be uh, down in St. Charles. I had the opportunity to meet with one of our companions, Pat Large. And Pat and I got a chance to share a little bit of each other's story. And one of the things that really moved me was when Pat spoke about how meaningful the covenant of the companions is to her, how the act of being in covenant with our community and with the church makes her feel a greater sense of responsibility and a greater dedication to our community. And I'm not used to hearing that word of covenant in terms of uh, outside of the covenant of Israel or the covenant of Jesus, but when she said it like that, it made perfect sense. We as human beings need to feel that we are in covenant with each other. And the act of covenants is, is really profound uh, when we see the way that it brings people together. And so I really uh, want to give thanks to Pat who shared her beautiful story and her own covenant with me uh, to help me better understand our spirituality in the precious blood. That's really great, Newton. I'm glad you ran into Pat and had a chance to chat with her. Uh, and what she says about confident is spot on. Absolutely. It's about identity. And generally speaking, slaves and the marginalized don't have an identity or don't have a positive identity. And Bob talks about how important this is to us as individuals. If, if we don't have an identity, then our lives tend to fall apart. And that's kind of a sad truth. But, you know, if, if we aren't special to someone else and no one is special to us, then a lot of the joy of life is gone. A lot of the meaning of life is gone. Very few people want to live absolutely alone with no contact with anyone ever. And the, I mean, even the desert fathers didn't do that. Uh, they got together once in a while. They had some contact. But um, talking about another thing is a rule of law. And usually when we talk about the rule of law, we get scared because it's like, how is the law going to be used against us? But with these former slaves, they did not have have a way of living together yet they had no agreements with one another uh it was just a bunch of small family groups and to have a law that everyone agrees to and say we are going to be in an ordered society and everyone has protection everyone has a place 
and we all have a relationship with one another ethically is important. And, and for I think in these days, um, when we get into arguments, we want to cut ourselves off from the people we're disagreeing with. And, and I'm beginning to think that's a really bad habit. But, and I'm guilty of that as anybody else. I'm not looking down on everybody else. <laughs> Keith, I think you brought up, you brought up a really good point about the laws and Bob made it a point of using a phrase that I thought was interesting, the proper ordering of society, living in solidarity with those and living in hope for a better and a more just world, that that was the law that Christ was, that Christ and precious what spirituality is calling us to. And it really just puts the whole issue of laws and boundaries and it just really turns it on, on its head there a little bit. And um, Newton, I'm glad you talked about covenant because covenant as a companion is something near and dear to my heart. I can remember when I made my first covenant with the community. And again, I loved how Bob talked about, um, it, it really crystallized for me the importance of this new community be, because he talked about how the blood connects us together. Those on the outside become part of the inside. And think of how many boundaries we have in our world, just men, women, you know, different um, ethnic races, uh, you name it, there's a boundary for it. And all of a sudden to say, wow, we have something that can reconnect us in ways that the world doesn't understand. Um, and I loved how he said a covenant bonds together individuals creating life in a wilderness of existence. And isn't that what we are doing today? You know, and I think that's why sometimes people look at the precious blood community and they're like, I don't really understand you. I don't really get you because they don't, they haven't seen that new possibility because they're still living in the wilderness. I, I would actually, uh, Vicki, I wanted to tag a little bit on, on this idea of the, the rule of law. And I think Bob Schroeder develops in a, in a little bit of a different way. I think in page 16, he says, those patterns, be they simple day-to-day -day routines of human interaction or the constitutional aspects of a social pact, I'm part and parcel of what makes and keeps us human. Uh, this actually, my, my reflection is rich from my recent trip down to uh, Ohio. But one of the things that was really beautiful to me was seeing the wonderful churches, uh, Dave and Jane McNeil, just as another wonderful couple who showed me around that area, brought me to the parishes of Maria Stein, uh, San Sebastian, um, the precious blood, and it was really beautiful to see how loved those parishes were. They may not be the largest communities, but they were all well loved, and it shone. It showed you walked into the space, and you knew that those were the spaces that people loved, and I think of those patterns, right, the patterns of our parish life, of our communal life, where on some level, we fight between ritual that's just something that we do that loses meaning over time, but also ritual as a thing that maybe we sometimes forget about paying attention to, and then they emerge to us in maturity as being really beautiful and profound. I think many people who grow up Catholic must certainly have this appreciation. Probably at some point in their youth, mass was just another mass. It was another hour of staring into the space or staring into the windows. And then there's a moment where they come back to you and they say, oh, there's something very rich. There's something very nourishing here. And I think that the law that's being described here, the covenantal law, the covenantal patterns can be, can be, I'm sure at some point, boring and sort of, you know, mediocre. And yet when we let, when we let ourselves participate in these things, when we let them grow with us and become part of our life, we may find ourselves coming back to them and really find ourselves in love and in awe of the things that we have been experiencing all along. 
it's easy to get stuck in the surface of a ritual and when it becomes habit and a habit we no longer pay attention to what we're doing we just go through the motions and the thing about ritual that's kind of you might say is is a distinction than habit uh, a ritual is something that's meant to take us on a journey outside of ourselves and connect us with another reality um, and that could be some that could be personal ritual as well as a ri as a rituals around the eucharist or the other sacraments um if a ritual helps you focus and makes you more aware of the presence of god and helps you enter into that mystery and enter into that understanding that we're bound to this god through blood it's a real thing that connects us it's not some um existential dream it's not some imaginary thing it's something concrete where god is with us and that kind of can help focus us and we can enter into the mass with that awareness uh for me that's something that is is lacking in catholic education and lacking in catholic formation period is is giving folks ideas of how to enter into the mass um in before vatican ii there was no attempt to get the people to enter into the spirit of the mass they wanted people to pray rosaries and other devotional prayers during mass which at least got them praying but the reform of vatican ii was the people are a necessary part of the eucharist and that makes all the difference in the world is speaking as a uh 40-year convert to catholicism of eucharist in general is um we can't really celebrate what bob talks about you know the ritual moment again i uh, that phrase the world of humanity and the world of god united we can't we have a hard time has the people in the pews um appreciating that when we have people who are presiding at liturgy who through no fault of their own i can't imagine after you've done six masses on a day and you've preached at every mass and you get to the eucharistic prayer and you're exhausted and all you want to do is get through it let alone proclaim it so you know i this is not being harsh to my brothers who are priests um I, I am I am in awe of that, but I just wish there was some way we could celebrate it. We could really celebrate what Bob is talking about. Definitely. Speaking as a priest, yeah, the, the, yes, the, the possibility of doing six masses on a weekend is something I personally find frightening. Now, I've heard some priests say, oh, you just do the same thing over and over. Uh, I cannot do two masses on sunday and have them come out as carbon copies of each other i am you know i try not to get into this locked in mode of just doing on the mind now i'm not saying that that i do a lot of fancy things with mass or idiosyncratic things or personal things that change all the time uh the stuff that changes is generally the words i have to say that are not scripted but it's yes keeping the focus and being that exhausted yes that's that's something and and it's something the church needs to address and that's all i dare say but i also think it's not just the priest's responsibility it's the people in the pews responsibilities i'll be the first i'll hold up my hand and confess there have been many times during the eucharistic prayer I have zoned out and thought about, I've got to go to high V after mass. I got to go do this. I got to go do that. So I'll be the first to admit, you know, I do it too. Um, so I, it's a mutual need for us to connect at that moment. Yeah. And um, we put a lot of emphasis, I think in the priesthood, we put a lot of emphasis on the liturgy of the word and about you've got to preach a good homily 
And I just wish we could put a little bit more emphasis on the liturgy of the Eucharist and we have to proclaim a good Eucharistic prayer and enter into prayer as deeply as we enter into the liturgy of the, of the work. And the Eucharistic prayers have a rich richness to offer us. They really do. I mean, if you read through it, we, we kind of walk our way through who we are as church and what we believe as much as we do when we recite the creed together, which people zone out on sometimes and fall into the habit of rattling the words off. Um, it's, I, I'm always trying to tell people to slow down when they pray. Uh, I don't know who holds the speed record for the fastest rosary, but I don't want to either. You know, as you guys were speaking about this relationship, especially around the Eucharistic table, and that table is so deep in my heart as the pinnacle of our service, because I am a convert, and I didn't come from a background where the Eucharist was the true presence. So I, I get the uh, the benefit of holding that conviction very close to my heart because it's very near to, to my own story. But at Most Holy Redeemer, I remember at one of our masses, it was customary before COVID where the priest would actually call the attendants at mass to circle around the Eucharistic table. And that to me, Father Matt, Matthew Link, who's a member of our community, has always been the touchstone where we move away from being bystanders of the Eucharistic prayer into participants. And I think it's reflected here in the way that, you know, there is that sprinkling of the blood on the people and they do say something, which of course in the Eucharistic liturgy, we do proclaim holy, holy Lord, you know, we proclaim the Eucharistic prayers in response, but that sense of just coming a little bit closer has been, I think the difference, and again, about that sense of bonding and going from being just a bunch of people into a community. And I wonder what is, because not every church can do that practice, but what is a, a, what are other ways in which we can sort of bring people in a little bit closer to that Eucharistic expression? Well, speaking as a former music director, I have a one word answer, sing. There is an old saying, you know, if you've got a nice voice and you come to church Sunday morning, sing and give thanks for the wonderful gifts God has given you. And if you can't sing, you need to sing and remind God of the gift he didn't give you. But that's, that's just a little funny bit. Uh, anyway, you know, singing is part of it. Um, just, just staying active. I know it's difficult. I mean, there are times I lose focus too, and I'm in the middle of everything. I'll confess to that. But um, what gets me, what brings us back to the Exodus moment is when the blood is sprinkled on the people, they are no longer bystanders. When the blood is sprinkled on the people, they are part of a journey with God. They're not on the outside looking in. And they're not on their own trip. They're on a journey together. They're on a journey with God to the promised land. And they are brought together by a rule of law that will sustain them and keep them in right relationship with one another. And they're bound on, by a vision. And... I, I think that's what we're looking for today as well. I think we're also bound by our baptism. And I think um, when you ask about how could we get a little bit closer to the altar, um, a subject near and dear to my heart is how do we recapture the ministry of the baptized? And how do we re-celebrate the ministry of the baptized? And because for so long, it the role of the baptized was pray, pay, and obey. Um, and we've moved past that. And now we're, we need, if everyone would embrace the role of the baptized, I think we would have a significantly different church. Thank you for joining us today. 
We hope that you enjoyed this discussion and we invite you to include your comments in the comment section, either on YouTube or Facebook. We invite you to uh, get a hold of the cop a copy of In Water and In Blood by Father Robert Schreider. And we will be discussing chapter three next time we get together. Have a good week.